go. Hello, this is uh, the Energy Hunter with Acacia Intelligence, the original AI, coming to you from the Rogue River Valley in Southern Oregon with the Walter Russell Secret of Light discussion group where we discuss energies and all things of the wave. Today, we're going to uh, take a little detour from our Alice Bailey a treatise on white magic that we've been looking at for about the last 10 or 12 weeks. And we're going to take the detour to a purely science guy. So as we've been talking with white magic, Alice Bailey has taken us through the body, set, talking about how the chakras in the body affect our ability to manifest. And we need to move from the lower chakras into the higher chakras and change the polarity, move up into the heart, the throat, and the crown, and get away from our lower chakras of the sacral and the root. So what we're going to talk today about is someone who says just the opposite. He says we need to actually get into our bodies, that we need to actually find out where this energy, which he calls cosmic orgone energy, comes from. But we need to actually embrace the animal, um, which is the we call man, and see how we can use that instrument to transmute and manifest this cosmic energy from above into reality. So both people have different views, once, you know, from theosophy, which is a very esoteric science, which deals both with um, the past and occult mysteries. And, you know, Rudolf Steiner wasn't really in agreement with theosophy in a whole, and he spun off and then uh, anthroposophy, which was spiritual science, a combination of the two. And then we have Mr. Wilhelm Reich, who um, had a history uh, with, with Freud, and he was a pure scientist, and he talks a lot about mysticism, and I don't know if his mystic, his uh, views on mysticism were quite correct or that well informed, but he actually believed that the, we should concentrate more on the human animal, as he calls it, and the, um, use that as the measure of what we do. Uh, some of the other men we're going to talk uh, today about, and we can go look at our collage, to actually talk about the men that we're going to talk about today. Again, I don't want to be sexist in that, but we've been talking about Alice Bailey for 12 weeks, and so now we're going to talk about some of the men who actually explore energy also. And uh, these are some of the people that uh, I follow very closely, and uh, they are kind of my uh, earthly uh, spiritual masters here that I follow, uh, ascended masters, I wouldn't say masters, but my ascended masters. Uh, teachers, you know. So the first one we're going to talk about today is Wilhelm Reich, and here you see him down here in the corner with the, uh, here's a, you know, painting of him in uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night, because Wilhelm Reich saw this kind of, this is how he viewed the world with this cosmic energy of the ether constantly swirling around. He was very big into the definition of the ether and that that was what was all around us. Um, you know, over here is his idea of his orgone accumulator, which actually brought in what he called the orgone energy. And we're going to talk about what orgone energy is. And he created these boxes for healing in which he believed that these would concentrate the orgone and actually uh, cure cancer and so on. Um, next, we are going to talk about Walter Russell, who we've covered quite extensively, almost 18 weeks in Walter Russell, or 10, now about 10 weeks, I guess. No, I guess it's about 12 weeks or so, more than that, 12, 10 months, 10 months with Walter Russell about the wave. We talked about the wave. We went through the book, The Secret of Light, uh, you know, Walter Russell's quote of the uh, secret to creation lies in the way. This is a painting behind that Walter Russell did. He was quite a prolific artist also, as, lo as well as a scientist and businessman and so on. Up here in the center, this is actually a painting of Reich's concept of orgone in a swirling vortex going to the centering point uh, with all the colors. This is later on, he'll talk about the creation of the galaxies and how they're formed in this type of manner of the spinning and the, it relates back to the ideas that are here in the center, which are from the uh, 
uh, science of philosophy, school of philosophy and science, um, which is uh, Walter Russell's legacy, which shows his concepts of the wave, the Fibonacci sequence, and how it turns into from the lesser gases to the higher solids through the wave, through what he would call radiation and gravitation, which are both opposite um, swirling spirals that are positive and negative. And then lastly, we're going to talk about Ibrahim Karim, who is a current uh, fellow who is still with us on the planet. The other two have since departed. Um, and Ibrahim Karim is uh, the creator of biogeometry, which is a study that's going on today in which he talks about different forms of energy, but also correlates them back to this idea of life force and the spinning in opposite but equal directions with a centering force. So all three of these men have very similar concepts and I've seen it commented on on uh, the, my channel, Acacia Intelligence, which we um load these videos too, that people would like to see more information on Ibrahim Karim and what, that, uh, what is going on, but also they'd like to see a correlation and a you know critical um, ad, uh, sum summary of each of the kind of energies and how they compare to each other. So we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about the different ideas and concepts, some of their quotes, some definitions of what they define their energy types to be, and maybe see if they're talking the same thing, to see if orgon is BG3, is parts of the wave that Russell talked about. So how do these, how are these concepts similar and how do they differ? And what is the life force that we're talking about here? Because where Bailey actually used the measure as more of how we compare it to the ascended masters, that that was our goal, that maybe we needed to compare ourselves to the ascended masters. Reich would say that we need to compare ourselves to how healthy we are. How are our bodies? How healthy are they? How are we manifesting these energies into our actual health and wellness? Because that is the measure. As uh, I think Troy Casey says, the issues are in the tissues. I'm sure that people say that too. So sometimes maybe the healthier our bodies are, the clearer our higher planes are also. And I think that Ibrahim and Walter Russell would agree with that also, that, you know, through knowing, through these higher sources, they are manifest in the physical. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about the 3D plane rather than the other higher planes that we've talked about in the past. And we're going to talk about these three gentlemen and each of their energy. So we're going to call this Wilhelm Reich. This will be part one of this series. It'll probably be three series. Cosmic Orgone Energy and Ether, Biogeometry BG3, and Russell's Mystery of Creation in the Wave. Any comments or questions uh, before we move on to the next slide? You know yeah. the stuff I was talking about earlier? Mm -hmm. They claim that th they create their energy with two spinning... Mm -hmm. uh, Solomon stars, but in 3D, and that's exactly this. It's that's why I told you before that we would be discussing a lot of those concepts today. And actually, as we get into biogeometry, we're going to discuss a little bit more of that also. But this is the crater and the and the parasites that are you know that are that took over our uh, physical world. And so, have, uh, yeah, but we also have the ability to create also using the same techniques. You bet. Anybody the picture, else? The picture uh, under um, Dr. Kareem. Mm -hmm. it, it, when I look at it, um, it it reminds me like all the planets and the energies that are, uh, you know, in in the sky. You know, like the twelve house. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't know if that was. Um, well, this is actually a you know something that I had picked up when researching biogeometry. Because within biogeometry, as we're going to talk about, you know, he's Ibrahim Karim talks about that, you know, this that this is a multi, you know, multi-dimensional, multi-planar system that we're in, mm -hmm. which is manifest in the body, just as Bailey talks about that we bring all these energies into resonance in our form, and that's the solid form we see. And so within this, we have the different layers and different um, 
energies that, that do form us within our uh, universe, that, that our inner universe and our exterior universe that we experience. Anybody else? All right, so let's move on. First, you know, we have a lot of talk on our channels on Alphabetic and even on this channel about orgone, you know, about placing orgone, using orgone, you know, what's it about? And so what I want to talk a little bit about is the man who invented orgone or the concepts of orgone. And his name is Wilhelm Reich. And he was born in 1897 and he died in 1957 in prison because he was arrested by the Food and Drug Administration and uh, ruined. All his books were burned, his experiments destroyed, and he was found in prison dead from apparent suicide. So oftentimes when you find people that uh, go through this, I'm not going to say everybody's beneficial because Jeffrey Epstein died the same way. I don't believe him to be beneficial. But there is some, you know, strange occurrence that people die in prison when they don't have any suicidal tendencies. So Wilhelm Reich was born on March 24th, 1890, 1897 in Galicia in the eastern part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, now Ukraine. Huh, Ukraine, a lot going on there. He grew up in the Bukovina on a large farm operated by his father. His first language is German and until 1938, he was an Austrian citizen. So two of the men we have here are Austrian. I believe that, I mean, are they? No, Steiner's Austrian. Um, he, uh, Kareem's Egyptian and I believe that uh, uh, Russell is American, but um, I believe that uh, Steiner was Austrian also. So there's a lot going on in Austria, especially from 1897 to 1957 with the World War, Hitler, all kinds of things. Austria was one of the first countries that Germany took back. The water guy too, what's his name? Schauberger. Yeah, he's also Austrian. Yes, <clears throat> and we're gonna see Kareem actually quote Schauberger later on. So while still in medical school, Reich attained membership in the Vienna Psycholo Psychoanalytic Association in October, 1920. Now this is really the beginning of psycho analytic and psychiatry. They're really the first person to do some of the psychoanalytics outside of the church. Before that, all of the counseling was done by the church and was not a profession. Um, Swedenborg came in in the 1800s and actually started some of the ideas of, of uh, psychology and the ideas of the mind. And then this later became more of a profession. And, you know, uh, Reich was one of the one of the first in a school where he was studying with Freud. So as an undergraduate, his recognition of the importance of sexuality had drawn him to the work of Sigmund Freud. So he was a student of Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis was a new discipline which had emerged from Freud's startling insights into the cause of mental illness. Reich soon became one of the most active younger members of Freud's inner circle, and was considered one of Freud's, Freud's most promising students, as well as Carl Jung. So Jung and Reich were actually two of Freud's most prominent students. Both broke away from Freud because they didn't believe that his uh, conclusions on sexuality were valid, and each took different paths, with um, Reich being, becoming much more scientific and Jung actually becoming much more esoteric, at least privately, but not so much in public. So Reich devoted himself to matters of technique in an attempt to overcome the limitations of psychoanalysis in treating neurosis. And in doing so, he observed that sexual energy is more than just an idea and that sexual gratification, in fact, alleviated neurotic problems. He discovered that the function of the orgasm is to maintain an energy equilibrium by discharging excess biology, biological energy that builds up naturally in the body. If that discharge function is disturbed as it proved to be in all of his patients. Now, what you have to understand is that Reich had a clinical practice for 25 years dealing with neuroses. 
Now, again, I'm not going to judge, you know, his findings or his uh, practice, but again, he is dealing with people that come to him because they are ill for 25 years, and he is observing what he believes to be the symptoms and what he believes to be the cure based on his background and education with Sigmund and Freud and through these um, colleges that he's gone to. So he's and it proved to be a patient with this energy you can need to build up without adequate release. Reich also discovered that in psychic disturbances, this biology, biological energy is bound up not only in symptoms, but more importantly, in the individual's characterological and muscular rigidities, what he called armor. So what he's saying is that he's not only seen it, you know, in these disturbances, but he sees it in their character, in their rigidities, which is then also transformed into their physical appearance and their bodies. So this is, again, after 25, 30 years of clinical work in psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis with people that were, you know, came to him for help. And this armor, this concept of this armor, this rigidity, which he calls armor, we're going to discuss when we discuss Reich some more. Reich's orgasm theory set him apart from his colleagues because it indicated that the libido, life energy as we call it, was a real physical energy that possibly might be measured quantitatively. Now, quantitatively is how much, you know, we could actually see how much of this energy is present. Reich's clinical, clinical work also helped him develop new therapeutic techniques to eliminate the patient's character and muscular armor, again, we're talking about muscular armor, and allow for the flow and discharge of the bioenergy to achieve what he called orgastic potency. Now, I'm going to go through all these definitions next, and we're going to actually see what he's, what each of these terms mean per, per, per Reich. The capacity for total discharge of sexual excitation in the genital embrace. But the widespread existence of sexual misery. So, the, so what he's seeing is he's seeing, again, this is Freudian sexual misery. He's saying that he's seeing sexual misery. Forced Reich to conclude that the solution to the problem of neurosis wasn't treatment. It was prevention. You have to revamp your whole way of thinking. Again, this is what Bailey says, right? We get to get to a white right way of thinking. We don't think correctly. This is what Walter Russell says. We don't think correctly. We have to get to a different way of thinking. Reich said so that you don't think from the standpoint of the state and culture. That you don't think from the state and culture, but from the standpoint of what people need and what they suffer from. Then you arrange your social institutions accordingly. This is from the um, book, Reich Speaks of Freud. So what he's saying is, is that this is a different concept of how we look at what the you know, world needs, what humanity needs, what culture needs, is that we actually look at from the standpoint of what people need and what they suffer from. We can theorize all day long about what they need, but we actually have to look at what they need and we can theorize about their issues, but we need to see what they actually suffer from. And then we arrange our social institutions accordingly. So not only did Reich, you know, talk about ailments, psych psychological ailments and uh, physical ailments, he also spoke of the need for uh, social change and in institutions. He wrote a book called Listen Little Man, in which he actually outlined a lot of the concepts of, say, the, um, the reset we're looking at today and what's going on with Schwab and those people. He outlines it exactly of what's going to happen and how it will happen. So he had some insights into what was going to go on. And so that's why we're actually looking at some of his ideas, because this is another form of energy that he's talking about. He's saying that he sees this as being the issue and what the solution is. And we're going to compare his issues and his solutions to some of these other uh, gentlemen that we also look at. Any questions before we move on regard to armor or 
Reich's concept of um, sexual energy or his ideas of what was wrong with the social paradigm. I have one question. How, the orgasm, though, doesn't that like go against, I don't know how he thinks about sex, but that thing with the Christ fluid in your spine and all that stuff? Well, you shouldn't yeah. be wasting it, you know, by... Yeah. And, and again, this, the, the, you know, what, what Reich would say, you know, he also wrote another book, you know, called uh, The Murder of Christ, in which he gets heavily into what he would call, you know, um, Christian programming. And that may be some of the things that we're talking about, even though we may say the word Christ or, you know, use the term Christ, that maybe those aren't Christ, Christ or Christian concepts. And that those are some of the concepts that cause the social armor. Again, I don't know. I didn't do 25 years of, of, of you know, clinical research. He did. So he was seeing these issues. Again, the, the idea, and one reason that I'm not a big proponent, I, I have studied Jung, but I'm, again, I'm an energy hunter. I'm not a doctor. So I have no medical advice or psychological advice. Anything I say is ridiculous, right? So therefore... But the things that I saw that for myself that I didn't um, pursue with depth psychology or other issues was that when we speak, we often lie to ourselves. We tell a story that we think is true, but may not be. And therefore, who's ever on the other side has got to, you know, interpolate what we're saying as true. It's our reality, whether or not that is our issue that, you know, it's based on our programming. Our conclusions are based on maybe false uh, premises and false conclusions, and therefore, maybe you know, talking about things is not the answer. It could be that we need to um, go inside and begin to uh, adjust our environment and our processes, and go to the mental plane rather than the logical thinking planes, and begin. To, and this is what Alice Bailey talks about within her right thinking and maybe not concentrate so much on the human brain, but on these other planes. And this is where, where Reich may have made a misstep also, because he was not really into the mysticism. He really did not like mysticism, but when I read his work, I don't think he actually understood mysticism for what it is. He was more of what he called mechanical mysticism. And um, we can get into that. I think we're going to get into that a little bit later as we begin to actually get into his book. Any more questions before we move on to the next slide? Okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. So I maybe we will talk about that later. But what I don't grasp at this point is okay. He discovered this new type of energy, or this, you know, focused on this energy that is called or or, or uh, organ energy. Mm -hmm. But what is the fundamental? Uh, implication of it that makes you know his findings very special okay. well we're going to talk i mean we're going to get into that you know okay a bit. so let's talk a little bit about his definitions and then we're going to you know that's really more discussed in the book right now i'm just kind of laying out you know his concepts you know what he saw and again he would not say that orgone energy was anything new it's uh -huh. the real basis of his um, hypothesis or cosmology whatever you want to say is that it's been around for a long time. It's just been misinterpreted. And it's been used as a method of control um, by suppression and by not allowing people to actually express themselves um, totally through the orgasm or through the sexual experience that created dams of energy in them that then created symptoms that then created conflicts, which then created dis-ease in their psyche and their bodies, which then manifested in symptoms, both psychologically and um, physically. And so okay. we're going to talk a bit about that, about what he sees as his armor. That's really, this is one of the keys is the armor, because again, this armor is what we're talking about, this programming by other people that says, you know, we, we have to suppress these things which will then act as a filter, which may not be beneficial. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more to go through the definitions. And I think of armor, I'm thinking of uh, a Victorian times with the long dresses to the floor, uh, pretty well, uh, pretty, 
well, of what they're telling us. But what I'm saying is uh, it didn't seem to be too much fun. Okay. Uh, so, so it went the pendulum this way. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of suppression, if you like. And because of it, it got, went underground. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it causes all kinds of problems. Like suppression of something is not a good idea. The energy has to flow. So anyway. Yeah. And, you know, during those times, we, you know, we had some probably rises in syphilis and other things going Whatever, on. Whatever, you know, lots of things. And, and because... I don't know the way they were bringing up the kids or... You know, the kids being separated, you know what I mean? Send them to schools like that are separate from the parent, you know, like this whole, I don't know. They try to separate people from their emotions. You know, it's uh, it's quite interesting time, I'm sure. Not that I've studied a lot of it, but I just look at it in books and I was like, yeah, okay. And, and, even, and even today, some people are actually, you know, saying that they need to have more sexual expression today because they're not expressing themselves in a sexual manner and actually need to do that in order to feel freer in their current life. And so that is beginning to move forward in some circles, some of our own circles that's moving forward. And that's one reason that we are looking at this to see what's really going on, what was Reich talking about, you know, and is it a solution or is it, you know, um, but again, his ideas are not pornographic sexuality. That's a different idea than the sexuality that Reich is talking about. So we're going to begin to get into that um, in his definitions. Any more discussion before we move on? All right, let's go ahead and get into his definitions. Well, let's do his quotes first. So we're going to do some quotes and then we'll do definitions. So William Reich again, 1897, he says, I am well aware of the fact that the human race has known about the existence of universal energy, which is called what you'd call it, orgone energy, related to life for many ages. However, the ba basic task, task of natural science and what he would be called natural science would be looking at the human animal from observation and seeing how it reacts to certain conditions, uh, consisted of making this energy usable this is the sole difference between my work and all preceding knowledge. So where natural science consists of making it usable, what Reich was looking at is trying to make it beneficial and seeing how it was being used to be beneficial and detrimental rather than making it usable. And usable would be that if you instill, say, a sexual energy as for lust or whatever, pornography, you could make money off it. You could actually, you know... Mm -hmm. Uh, you make people work in a different way, make people fear, you know, whatever ways, rather than actually making it beneficial for the health. So that's kind of where, he, this is from his archives of the Orgone Institute. It is sexual energy which governs the structure of human feeling and thinking. This is from his book, The Sexual Revolution. So again, when we talk about Bailey and right thinking, when we talk about the structure because we're going to talk a bit about energy and structure today from, from a lot of our um, gentlemen that speak today. This, but he says it's sexual energy that governs the structure of human feeling and thinking. The discovery of orgone energy was made through consistent, thorough study of energy functions. We're going to talk about energies and functions. First, in the realm of the psyche which we could actually call the spiritual plane, the psyche, the mind, the spiritual plane, and later in the realm of biological functioning. So he has, and this is from the book, which we're going to uh, cover in this series, Ether, God, and Devil. We're only going to really cover the last chapter, which is cosmic orgone energy. But this is really the gist of what he's saying, is that he started first from the psyche because that's what he was looking at. He was looking at as a clinical psychologist at people who had psychological issues, but he did begin to see those manifest psychological issues into the body, just as we see in German new medicine today. Reich was fully aware of this. He knew this back in, you know, the early 20s and 30s. This is what he was seeing when he was doing his clinical research. Um, and he was seeing that he's, you know, 
was based that the cause was the sexual energy. Again, don't forget he studied under Freud. That was Freud's bent also. Again, what is sexual energy? We're going to talk a bit about that when we talk about um, Russell a bit. And maybe we're going to talk that it might not be what we all think it is. So there is no doubt of the existence of an energy possessing extraordinarily high biological activity. It remained only to discover what its nature was and how it could be measured. This is from the cancer biopsy. So Reich believed he could cure cancer. He said he did by these orgone accumulators and by, by promoting orgone in the body, he believed that he could actually change the biological activity of the body through this orgone generation. This last quote is, the more success I have, the more I sense that I am in mortal danger. And the more successful I become, the less they will be inclined to spare me. They can hit me at any place and at any time. And as we know, he was arrested, he was destroyed, all his work was destroyed, and he was found dead of suicide in prison. Any questions on any of the quotes we just read? All right, let's go on next. Now let's talk a little bit about Russell. Okay, so we're going to jump from Reich's work to Russell's work. Again, I want to, you know, draw your attention to, you know, this image here, which is Russell's work. This image has been colored, but it actually shows the man and the woman, which is kind of the basis of Russell's work. And it's about polarity of negative and positive. Some would call it charge and discharge, but Walter Russell would say that they're both charged. So the idea that there's discharge is not the, the correct word. It's that they're charged, but in opposite and equal directions, which is again, back to what Doug was talking about earlier with the spinning vortexes of polarity in opposite directions, but in 3D. So we're seeing these vortexes here, right? These are the vortexes that are spinning the blue counterclockwise, it's cold. The red is hot in a clockwise. They meet in the center, and that is where creation is formed. So could this be seen as sexual energy of the woman and the man, seen as the positive and negative, coming together in the center to form creation and form healing? Maybe. Maybe that's what we're talking about. We also can correspond that to color. And it's going to be interesting that we're going to see this blue-violet. I keep the concept of the blue-violet in your minds talk so now we're going to talk about walter russell who was before born before reich and died after but they were contemporaries and they did most of their beneficial biggest works at the same basically the same times so what walter russell says is knowledge is cosmic it does not evolve or unfold in man so it does not evolve in man it's not fold in man man unfolds to an awareness of it he gradually discovers it. So this knowledge is not something that's unfolding. It's something that we're discovering. That's always been there. We're just becoming aware. And if you remember last week when we talked about Steiner, Steiner said that we had to develop organs in our subtle bodies that we didn't possess now. So the same organs we have in the physical body, the brain, the ears, the eyes, the voice, these were the same organs, the heart, the kidneys, all these organs we need to actually form in the subtle planes. So as we begin to develop these other bodies, we begin to actually become aware. So we're not really unfolding into it. We're developing the means in which we can actually access it, something that's already there. The electrical energy which motivates us is not within our bodies at all. It is part of the universal supply which th flows through us from the universal source with an intensity to set our desires and our will. So a little bit of this, we're talking about desires and our will. Reich would say that it's the ecstasy, right, that we're experiencing of the orgasm is really where we're getting this desire and will from, that as we begin to have this, this is our highest desires that we're searching for. <clears throat> when it becomes a part of every man's thinking that a single thought can change the polarity, 
of our entire body toward either life or death and can likewise change its entire chemistry toward increasing alkalinity or acidity to strengthen it or weaken it, or can change the shape, the shape, we're gonna talk a little bit about shape next, of every corpuscle of matter in the entire body. So what Russell's saying here is that our thoughts can change everything in our body, of, of our entire body. This is a little bit about what Joe Dispenza speaks about and his ideas of the mind and what we can do with it. In the direction of either gro growth or decay, we're talking about red and blue here. We're talking about these two spiraling vortexes. Then the medical profession will radically change both its principles and its practices with the ailments of the bodies. So this is why Reich would say that he was gotten rid of because he was changing the medical profession to actually view how we treated diseases and conditions differently than with allopathic medicine. So that's what he'd probably say, you know, and what's what he did say was why they were after him. Again, these are all Russell quotes. I believe that there is but one thinker in the universe, that my thinking is his thinking, that every man's thinking is an extension through God of every other man's thinking. So this gets back to where we are all one. This is the kind of the law of one idea where there's one universal mind. We're all part of that mind. And that we are just an extension of that when we are aware of it. What Russell said is when we're not aware of it, we just use our animal mind, which is just a remembrance of our own thoughts and our own programming and our own memories, which are not through this universal mind, but of our own experience and our own making and our own conclusions, which is what Reich would call the armor. That is the armor that we're developing where we cannot get back to the sense of one, to the sense of all this knowing. This would be what he would call the physical armoring and the character armoring. And we will discuss what that means in definitions later. So I therefore think that the greater the exaltation and ecstasy of my thinking, the greater the standards of all man's thinkings will be. So we have to get to an exaltation and an ecstasy in our thinking. What does he really mean by that? What does Russell mean by that? Each man is thus empowered to uplift all men as each drop of water uplifts the entire ocean. So the idea is, is that, you know, we don't have to actually go to the bottom and try to cure those that may not be aware if we lift ourselves we can lift others right around us and then the tide will begin to raise and then that will raise all boats the keystone of the entire structure of the spiritual and physical universe is rhythmic balance interchange between opposites this rhythmic balanced interchange almost seems like physical love between a man and a woman Right. This is this rhythmic balance interchange that's happening. And then lastly, in the wave lies the secret of creation. So a couple of takeaways I want to, you know, to look about that. Walter Russell also believed that it was polarities, female and male, positive, negative, that there was two different waves that were occurring, that they were, tor they were torsional in nature, one going in one direction, one going in the opposite, but both meeting in the middle to cause creation. And it was at this zero point where all things happened, the centering. This is when we looked at the magnet, there was two polarities, but the center was the knowing. Any questions or comments on this slide about Russell quotes? I like, the, I like this slide because it helps me when I read the, the book. Yes. Um, I, I found it a bit, a bit, how can I say this? Um, I don't know. I would not say mechanical in the descriptions, but this one seems like, you know, the messages, you know, come, come forth in a, in a clearer way. So I, I can relate actually, like just with one slide, I can relate well to his thinking, uh, which is something that, you know, I, I did not get from reading the whole, the whole, the, the secret of light. So I appreciate this, this um, summary. You're welcome. 
that um, that line uh, to uplift all men as each drop of water uplifts the entire ocean. Uh, I'm thinking of what uh, Mike Winter shared today uh, from Lars. Uh, I, you know, it's I think he's from Sweden. I'm not sure, and it was about healing water, and again. Uh, you know, holding the water in a bowl, you know, kind of thing. And so it's, uh, again, it was about thought, like the person, you know, the highest thought and looking at the water. And um, so I think, uh, yeah, well, I think he was more close to, to Russell there with the wave, you know, like of what uh, this is explained here. And I know this is probably this is one of your favorite slides. I think just so you like the color, you like my own books. Oh God, yeah, like it's and, and well, there's so much in there because you've got like, um, well, you know, sometimes we look at the octaves, sometimes we're looking at the gases, sometimes we're looking at you know, there's the so much in there, really. <laughs> yes, and and like you know, like I said, right here it says this is if you can't read this is how matter is formed in the 3d ah. okay, this is how it's formed this is how matter is formed in the 3d right this is what russell's trying to get across here in this i i thought of uh, when i looked at this at first like and also from the previous it's like uh, well yeah when i saw exaltation ecstasy i'm thinking uh, if you we can if we can remember when we feel really alive okay what that feeling is and we're and, seeing that uh, here right the spark going on right here because yeah and that uh, well that things are flowing well you know like so that so that uh yeah you can feel the energy you can actually you know for sure okay, any more questions before we move on to the next slide all right so this slide well, now we're going to talk about Ibrahim Karim and he has his own ideas of energy, and he, which he calls the BG3 and biosignatures. I don't know. We never really talked much in some of our uh, biogeometry slides about B, about biosignatures, but we're going to talk a bit about those today and actually show some of um, Reich's work over here in regard to what he's how he saw energy flowing. So, Doctor. Ibrahim Karim is 1942, so he was born at the end, near the end of both Russell and Reich's um, existence here on Earth. And he's still alive today. He's in his 80s, and I think he's in his early 80s, but he's still writing a book. His next book that's going to come out is going to be called The Physics of Quality, which he discussed with Paul Check about a month ago. I can't wait till that book comes out because I've done some work on that, whether or not that work is correct. I know that Dr. Kareem is a subscriber to the channel, and I'd like him actually to comment, if he can sometime, maybe on the videos about what he's seeing and whether or not what we're talking about is correct in my interpretation, because I'm sure the book is going to explain it much better. But these most of, every quote on here is either from his website or from his videos. So these are not any of my interpretations. They are what I pulled from his website or videos. So Dr. Kareem in his latest video that I have, which is about a year old, said that biogeometry is a qualitative, not a quantitative. And we've talked about this in the physics of quality, a qualitative science of connecting to the centering of the multidimensional vortex through a physics of quality. So if you want a picture of that, here it is. <laughs> right? Yeah. These two vortexes. Now, you know, when some people read Russell, you know, I know that for the first probably, you know, three months of Russell, I was seeing everything in a two-dimensional plane because when we look at the way, we see two dimensions. As we begin to expand our consciousness, we begin to see things in three dimensions. We begin to see a toroidal field, not just a plane. We begin to see the toroidal field. And as we begin to see the toroidal field, we read Bailey and Steiner and, uh, and even and Kareem, we begin to see planes of existence in higher, lower, and different subtle planes, subtle bodies, as they're also called in theosophy. We begin to understand that these energies run through and permeate all of those planes 
which is, as what Dr. Kareem says, multi-dimensional vortex. Not just a 3D plane vortex. We can often get caught up in the cube sphere of Russell. But the cube sphere is really just a manifestation in the 3D. We have to actually move past that and actually look to manifestations in the other planes. And are we manifesting or are we just actually passing through those planes to manifest in the 3D? Because as we move through these, these are what Reich may call in his view of the planes, cosmic, cosmic energy. He did see this energy coming from the universe, from being from the beginning, but he didn't actually believe in angels or different manifestations and other planes, but he did believe that there were beings, as he photographed later, um, in the orgone, in the ether. So that is Kareem's, Dr. Kareem's major concepts of biogeometry. It's this qualitative science of quality, not of quantity. Quality is a different aspect than quantity. And we've talked about that. If anyone wants to go back and look at my videos on the physics of quality, we cover that quite deeply. I think it's in some of the other Russells. We all, because Russell also talks about quality over quantity. And this is a kind of a newer concept because you can't measure quality. It's very difficult. That's why the tools in biogeometry are very helpful. But how red is a rose? How, you know, how sweet does a rose smell? These are all qualitative uh, measures that each person may have a difference in, but actually is very aware of. How deep is your love, right? Songs. We've got all these kind of aspects that are qualitative, not qualitative, quantitative. So within uh, biogeometry, one of the main concepts is the idea of the BG3. So within biogeometry, the BG3 is what is, it could be compared to what um, Reich is calling orgo. It's the centering energy. Now, you know, Reich says that it comes from the sexual experience, that it comes from the idea of sex, that uh, sexual energy. Uh, Kareem has broken it down into a little bit different. He's broken it down into three aspects that he's found. BG3, an emanation called negative green, is found at the center. Again, at the center. This is a centering aspect that we're talking about here. Is the centering of all energy fields, including those occurring within and around the body. So we have it internally in our structure of our body, and we have it externally around us. All, everywhere, like the ether. This is, as the ether flows around us, this energy flows around us also. The centering is the essential navel point or natal wave of natural power spots. Negative green is one of the three BG3 qualities. So there are two more. The second distinguishing quality of BG3 is a higher harmonic of ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is often seen within the spiritual realm, within the realm of the angels. It's also one of the uh, concepts within uh, Russell's of the highest form of the, 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 the female, the, the largest portion of that. The invisible light is in the realm of angels and light beings. Its vibratory characteristics are purifying and calming. Again, vibratory characteristics. We're going to talk a little bit about vibratory characteristics later on are purifying and calming, imparting balance and soothing effects to stressed living systems, including our bodily systems. Remember this bluish ultraviolet light when we talk about orgo coming up. The third distinguishing quality of BG3 is a higher harmonic of gold. This highly refined attribute resonates with its much denser relative physical goal. Its vibratory characteristics are enriching and bring wisdom. At the bodily level, its energetic properties support the immune system. So this is one reason that um, Ibrahim Karim suggests that why when we see the Byzantine paintings of saints and so on, or of angels, they have this golden halo around their heads that they're actually you know, emanating this higher harmonic of gold. 
that's where he actually found a lot of this BG3 quality was in and around the tombs of Coptic Christian saints. And this this energy was emanating from there. So again, within biogeometry, there's this idea of this universal energy that has a centering quality that some of his aspects are gold, which is also yellow within the spectrum of light, which was a centering quality within Russell right here, the yellow, right? We had the yellow as a centering quality. We had the green next to the yellow and we had the blue over here, right? Now, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about some colors later on also. As, and if anybody wants to get into some of the videos that we produced earlier in our discussion on the universal octave and color and so on, those are available too on Akashic Intelligence, the original AI. So next, <clears throat> the other aspect that Ibrahim Karim talks quite a bit about is what we call biosignatures. And one thing he talks about in the video is neg, anthropy, and entropy, which are Schauberger terms. Mm. Neg, entropy is the in-breath, and entropy is the out-breath. So neg, entropy is life, and entropy is death, as we call it. We call it creation and, you know, dissemination, right? Uh, K would be entropy. Walter Russell talks about this also in his cosmic clock, that that is the pulse of life, that the in-breath and the out-breath. But there is a pause in the center, which is the centering force that we've often talked about. And if you engage in Wim Hof type things, you can hold your breath and get to a centering point where you can become more aware, thin the veil, and uh, find uh, different forms of meditation within that. So as we begin to look at what are biosignatures? He says all living systems consist of functional. Remember we talked about functional a little bit before within Wright and within Russell also, flows that determine form. When you sh shape energy, you get function. So within this neg entropy and entropy, what Kareem says is that as we breathe, we bring in what Reich would call orgone or plasma or whatever you want to call, or, you know, uh, uh, ether, life force, we bring in life force. And then our lungs, by the shape of our lungs, actually form that into life. Then we breathe it back out into the 3D. So what the way that Kareem's approaching it is that as we bring in, we are the transmutation, right? We are the manifestation of life. We bring in this cosmic energy. We form it. This is very similar to what Russell would say, but we breathe it out. Russell says we actually form through the eyes more, but but um, Kareem is saying that we actually bring life into existence through the breath also, which Russell will talk about within the cos cosmic pulse. He called the inhaling as uh, gravitation and the exhaling as radiation. Excuse me. So what... What are biosignatures, right? Well, Abraham Kareem is great. When you take his course, you get quite a few. And he has a book on this also, a whole book, in which he shows what he believes to be what the energy signatures are of different aspects of the body. So within all these right here, these are just what he would call different biosignatures of the male organ. And I use the male and female organs because we're talking about sexuality. <coughs> with Reich, but as you can see, some of them look very similar, right, to the organs, you know, some don't, some just have, you know, a spiraling, but, you know, this is for the prostate, which is a different than the organ of the, the entire male organ, so these actually, and, you know, so what <clears throat> Dr. Krima said, if you actually create these out of wire or different things, you can actually wear them as pendants, and these bring in that energy and actually will help support if you have prostate issues, you could make something similar to this. You could actually, you know, begin to, you know, he said that there's a story that I was told in my biogeometry class that he was actually on an airplane where a fellow was having a heart attack and he could use his finger to actually draw the biosignature for the heart and it stopped the fibrillation of the heart and he got to rest. So that's a secondhand story. I was not there, but that's what I was told. So again, we have the ideas of these biosignatures for the male organ. We have 
biosignatures for the female organ, right? Um, they're different. They're, you know, for the, uh, for the ovaries versus the actual uterus, maybe, you know, but we can see that they all kind of have these, you know, attributes. Um, you know, this is the ovary here, you know, which may be like the, you know, coming from the ovary to the uterus, you know, during um, uh, oval ovulation, right? This could be, you know, kind of how that's working. So these are different, what he sees as being these, you know, energetic flows that determine form. So what we're seeing here is the flows of energy. Now what Reich had was he, these are Reich's drawings of energy themselves, right? Of the sexual orgone energy. And this could be very similar to this in a sense where we have both these two coming in and creating, you know. And then this one is, you know, showing the idea of the function of gratification. So this is this is from genital streaming merger. So this would be the combination of this biosignature with this biosignature in Reichian. Again, this is theoretical, but if he were to combine the two, this would be what Reich would be say, calling the sexual energy. It would be the combination of these two. So what we're trying to discuss here is that there is a functional flow that determines form from the energetic. This energy that comes in, I don't know if we'd call it BG3, but it is an energy that we're, that we're bringing in here. The more BG3 that we, from what Dr. Cream says, the more BG3 that we can create in, within these structures, the healthier they will become. That's what we try to do with the archetype ruler is we try to actually identify <clears throat> the area that is being, um, has disease create which plane the instance is associated with, and then we pr try and provide BG3 to that area to alleviate the disease and bring back um, balance and health. So any questions or comments on uh, Dr. Kareem's biogeometry definition, BG3 or biosignatures? So I guess the, the form, um, by using these forms, you can make your organs or resonate at the right, you know, like at the right balance, if you like, and bringing them back in balance. Correct. Um, yeah. So, so some of these, you know, images are on the different pendants he creates. Right. And, you know, he has some for like, uh, you know, uh, detrimental energies, you know, and, and so those are on like some of the, for, you know, different radio or um, electromagnetic waves. He has some energy signatures for that that you would wear so you can either wear these you know but again there was a question that i was asked well you know can you just draw it on you um again i don't know if the drawing's enough i, I know that there's greater potency in the bio if they're in a 3d representation that's why in a lot of his um devices that he sells they're all raised on the pendant themselves they're not just you know drawn Probably also uh, the type of metal use or, you know, because I know in uh, quantum energy um, from from Leela Lab, for example, um, the helic capsule, if it's in copper or, you know, like if it's in certain type of, of metal, it's, you know, it um, it's much more potent, if you like. So I wonder, I mean, I haven't looked at his site to see what um, what material is used, you know what I mean? And I usually make mine out of copper because I just use copper. Copper, wire. yeah. I just I just take electrical wire, you know, like mm -hmm. a, uh, like a twelve or fourteen gauge wire, usually like a fourteen gauge, um, and just bend it to these shapes. Mm. And you can and I've made like you know pendants from that, you know, large things too that you can hang up in the rooms and so on. You know, on the previous. Um... It talks about the higher harmonic of gold. Sorry, just the paragraph before. <laughs> um, uh, gold is used uh, a lot in homeopathy. You know, when something 
I don't know, I'll call it major to align or something. It's uh, if, you, if you're given aurum gold, like aurum, like in, in homeopathy, you only you need to take once or twice even. And it's like, wow, uh, I'm taking, um, I just got the Illumine Illumin gold line from Dr. Uh, Mando. Mm -hmm. And you look in there and it's got like, it's got gold and different things in it. And the way it's formulated, like, um, will help, you know, like with uh, the elements inside of me or whatever, you know. So gold seems to be, there's a lot of <laughs> things around gold for sure. Yeah, I actually have some um, tinctures that were made by Robert Bartlett, which is, wow. uh, I got from him, I got uh, gold, I got silver, and I got alum, um, not alimony, um, <laughs> I forget what it's called now, antimony, which is what Steiner recommends. Okay. Uh, that I also use. So yes, I agree that the higher harmonic gold is very beneficial. Um, that's why a lot of people wore it as jewelry because it did bring in these resonances that we're talking about. Not that it was seen as being that valuable for its scarcity, but because of its healing properties. Well, look at what, uh, when the Christ was born in Bethlehem, the three wise men give them frankincense, gold and myrrh. Yeah. And, um, Actually, in one of the <laughs> in one of the new uh, this other product I got, it's got frankincense in it. No, it's anyway. I, I I just find it fascinating that knowledge that was out there, and uh, we're just trying to reclaim them and understand it. You know, agree. the resonance that's in there is very beneficial to us. I agree. Mm -hmm. Any more comments before we move on to the next slide? Don't you think that, um, let's say you have a few organs, you know, uh, of your body that need to be kind of rebalanced. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that maybe, th th would it make sense to have the shapes um, matching the location of those, those organs for the, reson for the resonance to kind of be yes. most effective? Well, again, you know, sometimes, it doesn't mean that you have to place it over the organ. I, I would say that it's more about your intent, your attention. Intention. Also, you know, are you seeing it? Because one thing I know, one technique that we learned in biogeometry was you take, you know, like a, a plastic uh, diagram of the body. You know, you've seen them in, in doctor's offices and you go through the body and you see where you find, you know, the organ that you're looking at. You point at the organ and then you trace the bio. Yeah. And then you're actually with your intent, right? You're putting that energy flow back into the organ. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of it has to do with, you know, our intent, our manifestation. Right, right, you right, know, right. And seeing the energy flows. And, yeah. you know, but just having them, you know, on your body, like I know for some of these, um, you know, you can just wear it around your neck and having that in your energy field mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. is adequate. So sometimes it's better to have it in your energy field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's go on to the next slide. So we're going to get now into the definitions. I'm, I'm, this is going to be a little bit dry, but I'm hopefully going to make it somewhat better. But I think it's necessary for us as we proceed on through his work to actually understand when he discusses terms, what those terms mean. So the first term we're going to talk about is bions. This is the energy vesicles representing transitional stages between non-living and living substances. So some people would call this, you know, like, you know, the, the prima materia, you know, as things become from death to life, that this is a bion is what his term is. They constantly form in nature by a process of disintegration of inorganic and organic matter, so of both, which process has been possible to reproduce experimentally. They are charged with orgone energy. So what he's saying is, is that this bion has orgone energy and this, the life energy. So he's calling IE life energy. So again, this would be what um, Ibrahim Kareem would call BG3, this life centering energy. Are they the same? Same concept. You know, how we get there may be different. How we actually define it may be different, but there is this idea of a life energy and may develop into protozoas and bacteria. 
The next is character, an individual's typical st structure, his stereotype, manner of acting and reacting. Again, this is getting back to his clinical work, right? Where we're talking about the character of a person. This would also be what Bailey says is, you know, the character of people is very um, instrumental in the ability to perform white and black magic, right? The, the higher the character, the, the better the white magic, the lower the character, the blacker and, and darker the, the magic is. So the idea is through right thinking and right action, we develop right character. But again, character is a subjective idea. It's very difficult to say you know, what is the true character that's beneficial. Well, maybe that that harms is detrimental, and that that helps is beneficial. It could be as easy as that. That that wishes to help versus that that wishes to harm, that that wishes to free versus that that wishes to control. These are very simple concepts. They deal with polarity, but they could be very simple definitions of character. So character analysis. Now we're going to look at character. Originally a modification of the customary psychoanalytic technique of symptom analysis. By the inclusion of the character and character resistance into the therapeutic process. So what they're saying is that, you know, within this character analysis, within psychoanalytic techniques, we're looking at symptoms, but we're also looking at the character of the person. Are these characteristics manifesting symptoms in the body? However, the discovery of the muscular armor, we're going to talk about this muscular armor, necessitated the development of a new technique, namely vegototherapy, the, the later discovery of orgasmic orgone energy and the concentration of atmospheric orgone energy with an orgone energy accumulator. So we saw the accumulator on the first slide, if you remember the box. Necessitated the further development of character analysis, vegetotherapy into an inclusive biophysical orgone therapy. See physical orgone therapy. So what we're saying here is that as we begin to look at the biological effects we also had to do this character analysis to see what was actually going on in the psyche and what was the you know what was the thinking and the mindsets this is very similar to german new medicine maybe what are our blockages right what are our triggers what are the things in our character makeup that actually may constitute and um, invigorate disease in the body so let's look at what we what he would call the character armor this is, gets back to the original slide that we talked about, about the armory. It's the character armor is a sum total of physical character attitudes, which an individual develops as blocking <clears throat> against his emotional excitations, resulting in rigidity in the body, lack of emotional contact, and deadness. Functionally identical with muscular armor. So we have what we would call the character armor, which is of the psyche, which again, we could say is of the spiritual. And we have the muscular armor, which could be of the physical, which is of both the spiritual and um, physical. So, you know, the, the thing that kind of hit me here was this idea of lack of emotional contact. Because one thing that Bailey talked about <laughs> is that we need to actually suppress our emotion in order to get to these higher planes of mental capacity. And what Reich's saying here is, is that we actually need to develop our emotional bodies more and begin to use that emotional energy so we don't have this deadness. So again, the reason I'm bringing up these two different points is that they are two different views of the emotional body. But again, were these two people trying to achieve different goals? Bailey was trying to raise a higher spiritual experience to emulate the ascended masters. Reich is trying to bring in energies to fortify the body. 
So these may be two different goals that each one is trying to achieve. But within each, each is required to attain their goals. Bailey often talks about how we have to actually strengthen the body because the body is the tool that will help us to actually get to some of these. I mean, the chakras are in our body. If the body's not functioning properly, we can't change the polarities. We can't get to these higher areas. With Reich, the psyches, a huge aspect of a lot of this. So does contact with higher planes, with higher existence, actually promote a higher level of psyche and more right thinking? Or is that something that we can achieve on our own, which is what, what Russell would say would probably not be possible because it's not through learning that we achieve these things, it's through knowing. So where Reich may have been remiss on the ideas of mysticism and of spiritual knowledge, and where Bailey, because Bailey has only lived to be 69 years old. Her body may have not have been in the best shape, best health. Was she remiss on not bringing the body more in to her cosmology and teaching? That's why we're taking this okay. tour to talk about the body and the human animal, as Reich talked about. So within this, he does a little diagram here, which shows right here, this is the moral um, concepts of man. And then this is the, uh, you know, here it is, is that the emotion is to blame, right? This is kind of where Bailey is, he would say. And this one is where society is to blame. And then this one is the uh, heredity is to blame. And then this is the cosmic problems of existence. This is uh, nature is to blame, right? And then outside of all this is uh, cosmic orgone energy. So what he's saying is, is no matter what issue we have within our psyche or within the ideas of what is to blame for the condition that we have, they can all be remedied through orgone energy. That's kind of his concept here. This is the diagram of the realms of human thought and their objective interdependences. So this is really from more of a psychological model of what we think that we're, as we do deep um, psychotherapy work that we spit out, but what we're spitting out or what we're saying, our story, his story, that we're telling may not be accurate and it's really you know brought in and convoluted through our thinking mind as russell would say but regardless of what that is this orgone energy can bring healing but we still need as reich said he had to look at this character armor so what is that character armor really well here we have some of these drawings that he did of the character armor so in the center is our core our core b we call our higher self but around that we can form this area of anxiety right this this armoring the change of you know this armoring that we get which is from our programming which dr bear would call the overlays this is the programming that we're given we talked a bit about that in this week's i am the living law that there is a system and could be a plan. And there's a document put out, which is called Silent Weapons for Silent Wars. That's been circulating through our community. Um, that talks about the programming that may be in place to actually put this armor around our core. And so what that means is as that as we try to experience our knowing, as we try to experience our heartness, our, our, our love, whatever that is, as we begin to put that out into the world, this armor that we have developed through our programming, the change of quality is passing through the armor. So now we're talking about the quality of this love that we maybe have, this emotion that we may have, these aspects of our psyche that we may have 
that as they pass through this programming, they turn into rage and not love because this is frustration. And within that, we have this natural side, you know, striving and anxiety, which is turned back in on us. So as we hit this armor, you know, can I, should I tell him I love him or whatever, right? Oh, I can't. And then that's turned back into anxiety. And then it might go out to rage because of the armoring that we have around us. So what Reich is trying to say is that this armoring has been created by different, you know, structures around us, you know, whether it be the church or politics, society, culture, whatever that is, is that this armor is put in place. Sometimes unintentionally, maybe sometimes intentionally. I don't know. I can't say that. But he says that all people that he sees that came in for his 25, 30 years of clinical work, he said he saw this armor in all of them. And so he would classify them as two systems. This one right here is what he'd call the unarmored organotic system, which does not have the armor, right? Where you can actually express pleasure and express rage and the anxieties is, is contained within the periphery. See, in this system here, in this closed system, pleasure just gets turned back in and it, all you can do, only rage gets out. So this is his concept of the armored and unarmored system. So this is the idea that we cannot experience the orgasm in this proper way. That we can only turn it back in and we cannot ever get to a point of actually having the sensory uh, pleasure and the rage. We can only have rage because the armor is transmuting that and the quality changes. This is a pretty big concept within Reich's work. Any comments before we move on to some of the other definitions? Okay. Next one is character genital. The unneurotic character structure, which does not suffer, I guess it'd be genital. I should just the comma here or something. So it'd be genital character. The unneurotic character structure, which does not suffer from sexual stasis and therefore is capable of natural self regulation on the base of, basis of orgas orgastic potency. So, what this is saying is that those that are have the ability to actually ex experience pleasure and ecstasy, and that we, you know, that Russell talked about also, is that this is where we really begin to um, form and experience knowing that we actually because through our armor can never do that and only through this genital character rather than the character armor can experience that and then actually begin to experience knowing and ecstasy and this is the greatest power that we have within the manifestation realm it's, it's in the orgone capacity And we have character neurotic, neurotic character, the character which due to chronic bioenergetic stasis, which is lack of experiencing of orgasms or sexually or proper sexual health, operates according to the principles of compulsive moral regulation. So this is maybe what, you know, Giselle was alluding to earlier about during certain times of life where we had these uh, very high uh, compulsive moral regulation. Again, this is what uh Reich saw in his clinical practice over 25 years. So this isn't, you know, but again, it's his conclusions that he's saying this, right? It's his conclusions. But again, we're talking about this energy that's getting trapped by the armoring, by the blocking. And so pleasure never comes out. We only get rage. Emotional plague, the neurotic character in destructive action on the social scene. So what he's saying that as, as he saw with all these people that are getting this armoring around their hearts, around their emotional bodies, around their psychic spiritual bodies, that this becomes a plague. We may be experiencing some of that plague today. 
So as Bailey was saying, we have to get to this heart. You know, we have to live through the heart. Is it possible to do that without first removing our armor? One concept. I'm not saying it's, you know, the total answer, but I'm just asking. This is a question I'm throwing out there. And, and then, you know, we have the muscular armor, the sum total of the muscular attitudes, chronic muscular spasms with an individual developed as a block against the breakthroughs of emotional and organ sensation. In particular, anxiety, rage, and sexual excitation. So have you ever met anybody that when you go up to hug them, they just get real stiff? I mean, their body is just like, you know, I mean, they they can't experience any type of fluidity within their system. This was what he would call muscular armor. Then orgasm, the unitary involuntary convulsion of the total orgasm at the acme of the genital embrace. This re reflex, because of its involuntary character and the prevailing orgasm anxiety, is blocked in most humans. So he's saying it's blocked in most humans. Again, I don't know this for, I, I don't know most humans. He'd be probably drawing these conclusions from his clinical research. So it's blocked in most humans of civilizations which repress infantile and adolescent genitality. Orgastic impotence, the absence of orgastic potency is the most important characteristic of the average human of today. So what he's saying, and we're seeing this, we're seeing impotency in people and men especially, but are we seeing orgastic impotency, right? He said it's the most um, important care of the average human today. And by damming up biological orgone energy, in the org organism provides a source of energy for all kinds of biopathic symptoms and social irrationalization. So again, we're going back to the idea of the armored human, the idea of the impotency of the org orga of most humans to achieve orgasm in a, in a popular way because of their um, programming that is ch changing and filtering their ability to have pleasure into frustration or it's brought inward and turns into anxiety. Okay, so organic potency, orga orgastic potency. Essentially the capacity for complete surrender to the involuntary <clears throat> convulsion of the orgasm and complete discharge of the excitation at the acne of the genital embrace it is always lacking in neurotic individuals. It presupposes the presence or establishment of the genital character, i.e. absence of the pathological character armor and muscular armor. Orgastic potency is usually not distinguished from erective and ejaculate potency, both of which are only prerequisites of organic orgastic potency so i mean the more ability you have for erection so those that funk that would suffer from ed erectile dysfunction would probably have he would say it's not really a physical issue it'd be more of a character issue that we have from the continued um presence of this uh, armor that's being developed and over time just gets so strong that we now lose orgastic potency. Orgone energy, primordial cosmic energy, universally present and demonstrable visually, thermically and electroscopically and by means of Geiger-Muller counters in the living organism bioenergy, life energy, discovered by William Reich between 1936 to 1940. So when we talk about orgone energy <clears throat> and devices that create orgone energy, it's primordial cosmic energy. Is this, you know, similar to BG3? 
He says, Reich says that is demonstrable visually, thermically and electroscopically, and by Geiger counters. Is that true? No, no. I mean, we see that the cloud busters and things do have effects, but I have not really seen it visually in terms of, you know, any of these things. But he said that he discovered this in 1936 to 1940. Oranmuir, Oregon Energy Against Nuclear Radiation. He notes Oregon energy in a state of excitation induced by nuclear energy. DOR denotes deadly Oregon energy. There's a site here that I actually went to, which had a lot of, of papers and different works on this, which is this uh, psycho orgon, psycho orgone. So there's a link here if anybody in this video would like to go there. <clears throat> it doesn't work, though, the link. How do you get to the link? What do you mean? What, you try to click on it? Or you, can't yeah. click, you can't click on a, a picture, Doug. <laughs> no, that's a link, but that's true. We're in a video right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, what's the point of putting it in there? You Wake want to up. Write it down? Well, yeah, you no. can write it down. You can write it down, Doug. No. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes also, but you can write it down. <laughs> that's yeah, that's true. Name. In the show notes, in the description, you know. Watch this, magic. <clears throat> Does it work? Doc, I have it on. It doesn't work here either because I have it on uh, display. Organ, organity, the condition of containing organ energy, the quality of organ energy contained. And again, the reason I'm giving these because as we begin to read his his work, all these terms are going to come up, and I want people to kind of understand it. Organometry, qualitative organ research. Okay, uh, organo organomic energetic functionalism. This is the functional functional thought technique which guides clinical and experimental organ research. The guiding principle is that of the identity of variations of their common function principle. This thought technique grew in the course of the study of human character formation and led to the discovery of the functional orgasmic and cosmic organ energy, thereby providing itself to be the correct mirroring of both living and non living basic natural processes. Organomy, the natural science of the cosmic organ energy. Physical or uh, organotic qualities, again, physical organ therapy, application of physical organ, psychiatric organ therapy, mobilization of the organ energy in the orgasm. So this is through a psychic sex economic stasis, the damming of life in the organism. So this is stasis. So when we have this damming, stasis anxiety, the anxiety caused by the stasis of sexual energy in the center of the orgasm, in the center of the orgasm, again, centering with its peripheral organic discharge is inhibited, stasis neurosis, against neurosis caused by stasis, and work democracy is the functioning of the natural and instinctual rational work relations between human beings. The concept of work democracy represents the establishment reality, not the ideology of these relationships, which through usual distorted because of prevailing armoring and irrational political ideologies are never left at the basis of social achievement. So not only are we talking about, you know, having the sexual issues, but because of this armoring and we can't actually express our love or our compassion or these different feelings, they all turn into rage because of the armoring eventually that we cannot even have a functioning society because the work cannot get done in a way that is rational. So again, let's go back to those diagrams that I have expressed, you know, that we showed on the armoring and, uh, that he's seen this as the cause of most of our physical and social dis-ease. So that ends the glossary. Thank you for bearing with me through all that. I know it was a lot, but it did probably hopefully explain a lot of the questions you may have had on some of these terms. Um, any questions before we move on to the next slide? All right, so I, they're in here now. So anybody who wants to go back now and actually look at these terms, they can do that as we go through the other so let's now really jump off the ship, right? Get into other deep water and talk a little bit about how all this may pertain to the ideas of germ theory and terrain theory. So many of people who are part of the alphabetic community and uh, have heard or know about terrain theory and they know about 
germ theory. Can you mute Doug while you're eating? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to talk about kind of the basis. What is the basis within terrain theory that makes it different than germ theory? And again, there's lots of Andrew Kaufman, you know, terrain. There's lots of things out there. And I'm just kind of talk about a few concepts. One concept here, really, that kind of leads back to the ideas of this idea that, that Reich put forth of this biome, of the biome and it's, it's transferring from life to death and so on. <clears throat> so Anton Bechamp and terrain theory, which was which predated all the people we've talked about, not a, it didn't totally predate, but uh, it, I would say that Reich was born during this time. So pleomorphism is where it starts to get strange. We start talking about terrain theory. So our cells, bacteria, and fungi are the same stuff. So what in terrain theory, these are not different aspects. Bacteria is not one thing. Fungus is not one thing. And um, cells are not one thing. They're all the same stuff. Made of the same smaller elements, just doing different things under different conditions. It's kind of gets back to this idea of this one energy, this one power, this one idea of bringing in this life force. And crucially, what Beauchamp realized is that they turn into each other and back again as conditions change. The components of cells can reorganize to make a bacterium. This flies completely against accepted modern biology, which says that one thing can only consume another. It cannot change directly into it. So this is also almost the concept of the wave, right? The idea that we're, as these waves, one's creating life, one's creating, you know, generation, one's creating disintegration. This is the idea. So within terrain theory is also the concept of the wave, of these toroidal fields that, want, that are causing different reactions, but are cyclical, not a circle. So, and so the second challenge is the cell as the basic unit of life. Since we are taught, all taught at school about cells, inner structures, clearly the cell can be divided into smaller elements. These subunits are subdivisible, smaller and smaller. Royal Raymond Rife observed 16 levels of division beneath a cell with his Rife microscope. Now, some people may have heard of Rife technologies, Rife systems. The biggest thing that Rife had, though, is he developed the most powerful microscope at that time, which which they don't have today, which they destroyed, and which we cannot even create or is not available to us today. But the one reason that he developed that was to see these substructures. But also, Rife believed that everything vibrated at a unique frequency, just like Tesla. Correct, and so the microscope aided him in seeing what frequency each organism vibrated at because it was his theory even though rife was a germ theorist <laughs> and most of his practice was based on germ theory not terrain theory he did aid in the idea that each organism had a separate vibratory frequency he saw the pleomorphism but he did not stay with germ he did not go with terrain theory and he saw the different levels. But from this, he believed that if you could vibrate that organism at that frequency, you could um, agitate it enough to where it either die or become so agitated in the body that it would leave. So he has mapped frequencies to each organism that he found in the body. Again, my work with this, and I did quite a bit of work with Rife Technologies, it's based on germ theory and you have to really, because you're exploding a lot of things in your body through these techniques, you have to be sure that you don't get what they call Herxheimer's reaction, which is a heavily toxicity. Because what I found when working with this, again, I'm an energy hunter, not a doctor. I've only done this for people, for loved ones in my own family. That as you begin to explode or disintegrate, degenerate these organisms in the body, the reason that a lot of these are there is because your own immune system is already compromised. Your kidneys aren't acting properly. Your livers isn't acting, you know, your um, uh, lymph system is not acting properly, right? 
all these systems that we have to actually get rid of the toxicities are not, and that's causing this dam, this dam to occur within the energies. And so as, as you begin to use some rye, you have to be very careful that you don't over toxify the body. It does work from what I've seen, but we can over toxify the body. And maybe the approach that I'm more leaning towards is actually um, using what he would call his, um, you know, healing waves to actually support the body, support in, and in, in some in their protocols, they do work on the lymph systems and, and detoxification systems first, but we still end up with getting a lot of this toxicity. So um, this is what Rife had was that he actually had this microscope and he observed uh, these lower levels. We're talking about, you know, just as Bailey said that we as humans have are made up of all these smaller and smaller units that we bring into resonance through our magnetic bodies and cells, all these waves, all this energy that forms us into who we are. And we bring those in to these very small levels, but each of these levels have sentience also. And so we're made up of all these ideas and, and drives of all these different elements that we are made up of. So that's a whole universe that modern microbiology barely acknowledges. The smallest unit, according to Beauchamp, is the microzyome and the microzyma, plural, appear not only to be indivisible as life forms, but are incredibly enduring. So we're seeing that within, you know, this idea of our bodies, we have this microzyome, right, that is actually like this root piece that is the creation of our bodies. That, as Bailey would say, that we, our consciousness, brings into form. So this is where we have the psyche of the spiritual body and the manifestation of the 3D coming together as maybe the beginning with this microzyome. So Beauchamp showed that chalk from ancient rock beds could initiate fermentation in sucrose solution just as it contains living yeast. The same was not achievable using certain calcium carbonate made in the lab. His experiments were rigorous. It seems as if microzymes contained enough information, all right, information somehow to at least kickstart the reorganization of primitive life forms from basic molecules and possibly direct the process. So again, we have the matter, right? We have a piece of matter, which is the microzyme that has enough intelligence that when we bring in consciousness to that, <clears throat> life can be created and manifest so here's kind of the dot di the diagram of the pleomorphism where we start with the bacterial you know start with this somatids i don't know if anybody's heard what somatids are but that's the idea that there are these things you get spores bacterium and they go through a whole loop which actually ends up with mold which some people say that's what cancer is is a mold you know fungus to mold and so on so this is the idea that what starts out as a somatid goes through all these um you know, different uh, states, uh, all these different forms and ends up back as a somatid. There is no, there is no germ. The germ is the somatid is the so on. So this is really kind of like this function of the wave again, right? The cycle of the wave, the regeneration and degeneration, the gravitation and radiation is what Russell talks about. Any questions on this slide or on terrain or terrain theory for a limited amount of no? You, you said something about that it's a, the a, it goes back to the yeast. Where where, no, the cancer, not, where are you saying that one? No, so some people say that cancer is actually a yeast, right, or a fungus. I that cancer was your body. A, trying to heal itself well it, it does it, it, the idea is that you want to get back to the somatid so the idea is that you start with the somatid whatever that issue is you go through this process and then you go back to the somatid which is the origin so you go through this process and then you go back to its natural state which is the somatid right but they attack the healing part they attack it while it's trying to heal you is really exactly right. and they're breaking this up and so you never get back to the somatid the original somatics you're not going through the process no. unquestionably and so 
but again, you know, where is this coming from? Is it, you know, like we've been talking about this whole time, is it from, you know, this orgone energy, the suppression of that, so on and so forth? Can we really get to the healing if you don't take care of the armor? And, you know, these are other questions that we're that we need to look at as we begin to, as Reich said, look at modern medicine. All right. Okay, so let's see here. So, cosmic orgone energy and ether. Uh, we're about uh, at time right now, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Hopefully, uh, any questions on what we've covered so far? This is, again, the preference to begin to understand the work and begin to look at the work in a different way. And also to correlate it to some of the other things that we've had and discussed on this channel. Comments? Well, it's good that we're covering uh, our own energy because uh, it is discussed a lot. So the more we can learn about it, you know, it's good. Has anybody seen any correlations between some of the other concepts and people that we've talked about and orgone energy? It's the same thing. Well, it's the same wave. It's the same everything. It seems like everybody has it too. Every tree, plant. I mean, it's all they all work the same way. Mm -hmm. Unless I'm... No, I mean that's what I. That's what I, I. That's what I'm seeing. Also, I just you know again I'm trying to put this together to actually make some correlation between all these concepts, so we don't always have to talk about them as being different systems. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no immune system either. Where, where is it? Nobody can even see it. The it thing like is, I'm place. not. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No. no, I was going to say like you know. It seems everything has life energy, but I guess the plants do not have armor. <laughs> or maybe they do. Well, maybe they do because we're actually maybe they do, yeah. we're, we're introducing, you know, chemicals to them, right? Right. Yeah. You know, that are um, mycosophates and other things that could be giving them armor that's not allowing them to absorb sunlight, function in a natural mm. way. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. You know, okay. We could, we could be stressing them with our thought forms, right? We talked about how plants, if you say nice things to them they do better oh yeah yes. so, you know we, we we can be sloughing off our thought forms and our armor onto different things uh, to our animals you know to anything around us that actually is sentient i'm sure that we can yeah. um entangle within our armor uh yeah. through you know the ideas of, of uh, quantum entanglement uh create these things I definitely experienced that with my plants, it's with so my cool. orchids, like the entanglement. Mm -hmm. It's kind of amazing. If you, the, that Mizuru Emoto, I don't know if you ever heard of the, the Japanese yeah. guy. Yes. Amazing what he did. Yeah. They had one place, it was like a lake or something, and, you know, th like uh, thousands of people around the world, and it changed the, you know, the poison lake was not poisoned anymore. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and this entanglement, you know, is what Bailey talks about within our thought forms that we can create through mm -hmm. our desires. And, you know, the one reason I'm bringing this up because she does not talk about the animal body as much. And this may be within our manifestation that this body is the trans, is the most powerful transmutation uh, manifestation device that's ever been created. But it yeah. starts with our mm -hmm. attitudes and our thinking and our emotions and our armor. And if we can't get rid of the armor, the quality of our manifestations may be um, degraded. Uh, uh, but the armor doesn't seem natural. It seems like this is what the, it's all about. There's something that created this thing. Well, the armor is due to programming to, to thoughts that may not be natural, yeah. but they, they may be inherent. There's a different story to that. True. That, that men, you know, this is a natural man that, as Walter Russell said, we're not unconscious, we're unaware. And that once we become aware that we create our armor, you know, that it's a natural thing for men to create armor because of our um, 
bodies that we have because of the instinctual aspects of flight or fight of you know need for things that we jump to within our thinking minds the ideas that create the armor and this becomes instinctual and then becomes a spiral and we can't get out of it once the armor begins to be created we don't know how to get out of it because we don't even recognize it's there so you know we're being so what i'm trying to propose here as we become more aware of the higher planes of the subtle bodies of the armors these will all allow us to manifest in a degree that's more beneficial to our existence and it's hard to believe that your own thoughts are not your own thoughts mm -hmm. Any more comments before we close out here? Okay. This is the Energy Hunter with Acacia Intelligence, the original AI, and the Walter Russell Secret of Light group. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you all for enjoying and, in, and engaging in the conversation. Um, please like and subscribe for all those who are out there. Again, there's a lot of you know videos we've put out on some of this material we discussed today. Uh, Walter Russell, Biogeometry, uh, Alice Bailey. Um, so we're going to meet again next week. Like I said, we'll probably be in, in this uh, chapter. We're going to discuss uh, the Chapter 5 next week. Um, also, there are other videos uh, from Ibrahim Karim on the site that, that are, are beneficial to watch because they speak a lot about his work. So, um, again, please like and subscribe, and we will see you all next week uh and uh thanks for joining <laughs>